Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you for having me here at the Open Education Global Conference. I'm, um, yeah, delighted to be here after it was a challenge to, to get here due to the international travel restrictions still uh, in place. But anyway, let's get on with this. Uh, my uh, presentation today uh, will be necessarily multilingual as uh, I come from Ecuador and many of the concepts and many of the uh, ideas that I would like to present to you uh, will also be in, in Spanish. So uh, I uh, hope that won't be too much uh, of a problem and we can still have a multilingual dialogue as uh, is the idea of this conference uh, as well. Also, I'd like to start uh, mentioning that um, Today is uh, May 24th in, in my country, May 24th of 1822, so exactly two centuries ago, was the day that uh, the Bolivarian forces of independence, South American independence, finally defeated the, the loyalists, the Spanish loyalists, and uh, the, the, what was then called the, the Great Colombia, the unity of Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador, uh, finally gained their, their independence. So it's a special day for us in, in Ecuador, and uh, it's important uh, that uh, we talk about uh, uh, also sovereignty and independence in the context of knowledge, uh, technology, and educational resources uh, today. So. With that, uh, thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, University of Nantes and uh, Open Education and all the other organizers. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me here to, to speak uh, today. So today I will talk to you, and hopefully we'll have a bit of time to discuss towards the end about Buen Conocer. Buen Conocer is roughly translated into, you know, good knowledge or knowledge for good or good knowing, and uh, I will try to discuss some of the policies that uh, I implemented together with a very large uh, team of you know, hundreds of uh, courageous and professional Ecuadorians and you know, thousands and thousands of teachers all over the country and students and artists and so on. Uh, that were covered by the Ministry of Knowledge and Human Talent of, of Ecuador. So you might start wondering, uh, what is this thing, that the Ministry of Knowledge? I will talk about all of this, and I will also talk about what Buen Conocer is. So, how do we get to Buen Conocer, or this uh, concept that we're going to try to, to discuss and define today? Uh, first, we have to begin from the start of this story. Ecuador had undergone a very uh, unstable uh, democracy in the early 2000s. Uh, in the late 90s, we had a huge financial crisis. Most of the banking system went under. We had millions of people leave our country due to the crisis. Uh, there was a basically loss, loss of complete faith in the democratic system. And uh, after a, uh, an election in 2006 that elected Rafael Correa as president, we had uh, his main uh, campaign promise was we're going to call a constituent assembly. So we're going to rewrite Ecuador's constitution and we're going to do it in the most participatory manner possible. So a new constituent assembly was called upon. People elected their representatives. But then the representatives themselves basically opened the doors of a new parliamentary institution, a parliamentary building that was uh, created for this purpose, and received you know, tens of thousands of people who came with their ideas, their proposals as to what should be written on the Constitution. Uh, in Latin America, this tendency of uh, rewriting the Constitution's uh, uh, follows what is the concept called neoconstitutionalism, which is basically quick, rapid change without you know, changing minor laws, but going straight for the constitution um, was a, a tendency at the time and is, is still now, as you can see from the experience in, in Chile, 
with the Constitutional Convention that was uh, uh, that is taking place right now, and that is basically uh, uh, proposing major major reform. So uh, one of the main uh, uh, transitions from the old regime to the new uh, the new design of our democracy was that we migrated from representative democracy to what's called participatory democracy. Now that's a mouthful, uh, and there are some operational mechanisms to make that happen, but uh, the, the, tra the transition is a bit difficult because, you know, most of the legal texts and uh, the political culture is not used to putting so much power at the hands of the citizens, uh, the citizens directly. So uh, there is a, a, a long transition until people understand that they are really in charge of their destiny. Sovereignty thus directly belongs to the people, and it involves, you know, that even after you elect your representatives, even after you elect your president and so on, you have a right to continuous participation in the destiny of, of your country. So the new constitution was uh, written up. It's uh, fairly long has many details, and it was approved by referendum in 2008. One of the main concepts of the new constitution of Ecuador is called Buen Vivir. Buen Vivir is both a utopia, a horizon, a paradigm, and an alternative to development. Uh, you see, in, in, in Latin America, we have these discussions uh, uh, about, you know, how to reach development, how can we overcome underdevelopment, how can we, uh, you know, not be so third world, how, 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 how can we overcome the difficulties of being a, 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 of a colonial uh, past and so on. And um, most of the literature uh, developmentalist literature and the tradition has been basically just follow the footsteps of the industrialized countries. So that means basically, you know, just grow capitalist forces, grow the economy, try to re redistribute some, and then you will eventually one day, after perhaps hundreds of years, reach the level of development of the rich countries. Now, Buen Vivir is a complete alternative to even the paradigm of development. Do we really want to replicate the patterns of consumption, of misuse of natural resources? Do we really want to replicate that kind of development that has put our planet in danger, that has our species in danger? Or should we try something else? Well, Buen Vivir comes from the Andean and Amazonian uh, cosmovision of indigenous peoples in, uh, in the Andes and the Amazon. And it is now the official constitutional objective of the entire state of the Republic of Ecuador. So Buen Vivir goes beyond the traditional thinking of development or economic growth. It implies having harmonious relationship among humans and also between humans and other species, between humans and the natural environment. Uh, so it has a lot of complexity in it and uh, most of the uh, operational details are still to, to be uh, written, are still to be developed, are still pending uh, to be uh, converted or instrumentalized. Uh, one of the things that we discussed uh, when I was in the Ministry of Planning in Ecuador was we need new metrics for measuring our society. Otherwise, we'll just keep on replicating the standard of you know, the OECD and the United Nations uh, economic systems, 
which is basically GDP and GDP per capita and so on. Maybe we should measure something else. Maybe we should measure our mental health. Maybe we should measure how we relate to future generations. Maybe we should measure how we deal with uh, social and ecological conflict among ourselves. Maybe we should take into account, uh, you know, uh, crime statistics into measuring well-being and so on. And maybe come up with this new metric uh, to really evaluate how we're doing. Well, we took this challenge seriously. And this is where my story begins personally. I was designated as the Deputy Secretary General of Planning for the Buen Vivir, for Good Living. I uh, tend to have really nice uh, job titles <laughs> in the past. And uh, my duty was basically to think about the future, not in the traditional linear, linear terms of, you know, basically more accumulation and trying to reach a very distant horizon of industrial development, but actually how to build something conceptually different and still try to get there within a defined time frame. So my job was to think about the paradigm itself and then how to achieve that utopia that we were uh, creating in, in our society. And um, when I was at, at the Under Secretariat for uh, Planning for Good, give, for good Living, uh, we had a, an excellent team that wrote up a plan. It was called the National Plan for Good Living. And you can uh, still find it online, uh, but uh, in the Wayback Machine, because <laughs> it's been censored by the current government. So um, the, the, the path is a complex set of, of goals and strategies and uh, very detailed instructions as to what uh, the government, uh, the state level, but also society in general has to do in order to reach this, this paradigm of Buen Vivir. When, there, when we want to uh, try to explain what Buen Vivir is to, to people who have never heard of it before, uh, we try to may, uh, raise some comparisons uh, to what perhaps others have heard of. And I think the, at the international level, the thing that most resembles it is the uh, international covenant of uh, uh, social, economic, and cultural rights. And so if we can build a framework that uh, takes human rights in the diversity of their of all these rights that exist, then we can uh, try to uh, reach a similar understanding of what Buen Vivir is. One of the things that we found when we were uh, developing this plan for the future was that we needed to govern our own knowledge system. We found that even if we made material changes to our existence, we you know, provided housing and food and shelter and clothing and, and, and the basic uh, material needs of society, uh, that wouldn't be necessarily self-sustainable because we needed knowledge, we needed wisdom, we needed uh, concepts and ideas and technology to make that self-sustainable in time. So, the people who wrote up the Constitution were very uh, uh, explicit in this, and we have constitutional level obligations of the state in terms of science, technology, innovation, and ancestral wisdom. The Constitution in its uh, eighth section of the development regime talks about all of this. And uh, it, uh, it talks about science and technology in the context of the respect of the environment, of nature, of life, 
of cultures, in plural, and of sovereignty, and has the objective of uh, to generate, adapt, and diffuse scientific and technological knowledge, also to recover, strengthen, and empower wisdom, uh, ancestral wisdom, also to develop technology innovation that can strengthen national production, elevate the efficiency, productivity, improve the quality of life, and contribute to Buen Vivir. So as you can see, this is a pretty well thought out system of science, technology, innovation, and ancestral wisdom that basically told us what we needed uh, to do in terms of the policy of what came to be known as the Ecuadorian Ministry uh, of Knowledge. Now, the Ecuadorian government was divided into six large sectors. And uh, the sectors were co coordinated by a coordinating ministry. So uh, we had the sectors, the following sectors. The strategic sectors, we had the social development sectors, we had the security sector, we had the economic policy sector, we had the production sector, and the newest of them all that was created, the, the last sector to be created in the organization of the state was this one, the knowledge and human talent sector. Now, why was this sector named like that, the knowledge and human talent? Let's begin with the second phrase. We wanted to break paradigms when uh, sometimes you hear in an organization or in a company or even in an institution dedicated to knowledge talk about human resources, right? The human resources department, the HR people. But when you call the department or the area in charge of managing the you know, lives and aspirations and uh, well-being of the people in your institution, in your organization, and all of a sudden you call them resources, you are basically uh, making them things and not people. When you consider humans as resources, you will then stop to think their resources for what or for whom and you come to understand that the history of the term is absolutely linked with the primacy of capital over human beings. When we uh, change the denomination of human resources to human talent, uh, perhaps we are not overcoming that completely, but at least we are now putting the humans at the center of uh, the discussion of human talent policy, how to improve human talent, how to foster it, how to uh, put use value into, into that. And conocimiento or knowledge uh, has to do with this intangible uh, asset, this intangible element that allows us to uh, avoid permanent dependency on natural resources. Our societies, in Latin America especially, are very dependent on what is called extractivism. So basically taking things out of nature and physically sending them elsewhere to uh, provide for exchange value. So get a few dollars and then buy something else with them. When we talk about knowledge, we talk about slowly but surely replacing this dependency on material nature and trying to make our economic system more dependent on our brains, on our knowledge, which is of infinite and non-competitive nature. So the Ministry of Coordination for Knowledge and Human Talent uh, had a lot of duties. I was in charge of coordinating education policy, 
but also the higher education uh, institutes, uh, universities, uh, and so on, the, the councils that were in charge of higher education policy, also science, technology, and innovation policy, ancestral wisdom and ancestral languages policy, intellectual property was how we re re-denominated that as uh, intellectual rights. We wanted to get away from the definition of, of property the qualifications and competency, competency framework policy, uh, the laboratory policy, culture and the arts policy, heritage and social memory policy, so everything that has to do with museums, libraries, and so on. Uh, the creation of new universities for our uh, uh, aspiration of Buen Vivir. The creation of entire new city called the City of Knowledge, Yachay and uh, the public service uh, career of our public officials or public servants, people that worked for the state. Uh, so as you can see, uh, there, there was a, a lot to do, and we organized our work into what we call the prospective agenda uh, for the knowledge and human talent sector, called uh, Ecuador hacia el 2035, Ecuador towards 2035. We set a 20-year uh, plan uh, to uh, achieve our goals in terms of getting a bit closer to, to Buen Vivir. And that implied basically uh, democratizing knowledge through very uh, heavy investment in education and all the sectors that I have mentioned. This uh, plan was a quantitative-based uh, uh, planning exercise with a ve very rigorous uh, framework to, to you know, basically quantify how many teachers we needed, uh, how many students were going to be in the system in every one of our very diverse territories, and uh, how many uh, uh, students we thought that we needed in each type of uh, uh, career in, in the universities, uh, and, and so on. So. It was a, a very demanding uh, work, it took us a couple of years to, to do, but it's there, it's available there uh, to be uh, used, replicated, uh, used as a reference as well. And, and I think uh, it's perhaps one of the most uh, important references that our country has in terms of uh, long-term planning uh, in, in, in sort of knowledge policy, right, in, in knowledge policy. Uh, there were many, many things uh, that were, uh, frankly, beautiful when I was in charge of this Ministry of, of Knowledge. And we had uh, the council meetings, you know, like here in, in France, there's the, the, the cabinet meeting, right? All the ministers meet. Well, we had sub-cabinet meetings for our sector, where all the ministers and the people responsible of the following agencies were there. And we created a lot of uh, uh, in trans-institutional cooperation that, whilst may seem logical in the real-life public sector, it is sometimes very difficult to get two institutions to talk to each other. So uh, that was basically our job, to try to get that to happen. And we had uh, uh, a lot of fun uh, while we also had major uh, successes in uh, managing this, uh, this sector. I think uh, we had uh, important uh, successes there, important uh, uh, elements that were recognized around the world. We improved our educational uh, system from perhaps one of the worst in Latin America to be in the average of Latin America in a few short years. We had an in ex extremely uh, quick uh, increase in um, uh, our science outputs and our technology uh, development as well in a decent intellectual property framework in trying to rescue the ancestral wisdom as I will try to uh, detail in, in the following uh, few slides. So one of the things that we decided to do in our Council of Knowledge and Human Talent was Buen Conocer. So Buen Conocer was a project that uh, counted on experts from around the world 
it was uh, organized also as a, as, a, as a project, but it had a conference component uh, where people from different countries in the world came to discuss what free, free, libre, open knowledge meant in the context of a developing country, in the context of Buen Vivir. And uh, a lot of uh, good ideas came out of this. And it basically meant, you know, if you were going to have this paradigm of Buen Vivir, of harmonious relationship among humans and with nature and with the environment and so on, how would that translate in terms of knowledge policy? And of course, open knowledge, open education, open resources, open source, and so on, was definitely one of the categories, one of the uh, main elements of what buen conocer uh, would, would mean. So we translated, again, the paradigm into concrete instruments of policy making. One of the things that we led was uh, the, and we called it updating to free software, right? Uh, a lot of times the people, or at least in Spanish, they use the concept migración or migrating to free software. We thought that in the context of, the mig of Ecuadorian migration, which meant the expulsion of millions of people from our society, it wasn't the right term and we use the term updating because we think it's better technology. It's more, uh, it adjusts to our principles. And uh, we had, you know, a, a very dense policy framework for uh, the, the software libre policy, um, basically uh, deciding that our entire sector, our schools, our universities, uh, public institutions and so on had to uh, move to free software. It wasn't an easy task. The cultural practices of using proportary uh, software and proprietary technology are deeply ingrained in our societies. And uh, it, it was a, a very conscious effort to try to uh, move forward. Uh, I remember we even uh, had an installation of the Linux operating system in, in the uh, government institution computers and the public servants were complaining that they weren't used to it, that they wanted to go back to uh, the, the dominant uh, technological providers and so on. But, you know, you have to develop policy around it. And one of the things that we found was that we had to start at a very young age, right? So you had to start uh, in the school systems, you had to at least teach both you know, when you were uh, a young student so that you would be comfortable in this environment of more freedom, of governing your own technology, of having technological uh, sovereignty. So uh, we, that, that took a, a lot of our uh, time as well. Perhaps one of the most interesting efforts was the development of uh, wiki legislation. Right, so it was the construction of our knowledge law, which in Spanish is called Código Orgánico de Economía Social del Conocimiento e Innovación. Um, and uh, this law was constructed, it was built collectively with a wiki uh, framework. So we put the, the texts of the law in, on, a, on, a, on a wiki system, and then people from all walks of life could contribute to the law, to the draft of the law, by suggesting articles, modifications, changes, and, and so on, that would then be delivered together with the final draft to our national parliament so that then they could discuss. Um, I think this is uh, very, very important, and I think, in fact, this should be raised as a, to, to a sort of uh, transparency standard of lawmaking, so that, uh, you know, when uh, in parliaments there are modifications to, to drafts of laws, you can see uh, what sector is putting what, right? Because otherwise, 
Sometimes laws come out and you say, hey, where, where did that come from? Oh, and then you find out that it was lobbied by somebody else or an interest group. And uh, I think it, it uh, gives a lot of transparency to the lawmaking process. So uh, we called this effort uh, the Wikikoesk, which uh, was uh, very important in the construction of this law. It took a long time, but uh, we thought it was, it was worthwhile. Uh, this effort was led by the Secretariat for Higher, Higher Education, Science, Technology, and Innovation. We didn't stop there. The, the law was eventually passed by our uh, parliament. Uh, it was one of the, the last laws that was passed uh, during the Correa government. And uh, we decided to experiment with many other policies. One of them was uh, to try to democratize one of the most conservative forces of the government, of the state, which was the central bank. I, I, I started my, uh, my uh, public service career at the Central Bank when I was uh, 21 years old, and uh, I saw from within how uh, extremely conservative uh, that institution was. So we said, how can we use knowledge policy to try to democratize one of the most conservative institutions that, you know, basically uh, can, can controls the power of the economic system in, in a society. And in Ecuador, we implemented a policy of uh, a electronic money system, right? And this was 2014. <laughs> and then the pilot that I will explain happened in 2016, way before the current discussion of what are now called central bank digital currencies. But what we did was basically push our central bank to open its accounting and core banking system so that transactions could be done directly by citizens. And we uh, basically organized a hackathon for that purpose. To my knowledge, this is still the only, definitely the first, but I still think the only hackathon uh, developed uh, by a central bank, totally open to uh, social innovators to develop uh, uh, pertinent and appropriate technologies for the use of our uh, society. Uh, we are very proud of this effort. We had uh, amazing developments in a very short time span, uh, basically uh, solutions for uh, people who had uh, some sort of uh, handicap, uh, people who had uh, disabilities, people who had uh, uh, who wanted to use uh, the, the bus services uh, and so on with electronic money uh, issued by our, our central bank. So it was a, uh, an interesting effort and this is the kind of things that uh, we pushed with open innovation systems, right? So basically forcing the government institutions to open up with APIs, with uh, interfaces, so that innovators could access this very valuable and secret knowledge that used to be secret and then use it for a uh, social purpose. We also organized uh, the, um, uh, the first uh, Ingenia Tech contest, which was basically a uh, analysis we did of the procurement policy of our country, right? So we analyzed what were the main purchases of our government, right? So printers, <laughs> cartridges, computers, and, and so on. And we said, okay, is this, are these printers being you know, made in Ecuador? Are the repairs uh, provided in our country? Are they imported? And because we are developing a small country, we have to try to save our hard currency as much as possible and we analyzed our government purchases and how much of that was imported from abroad. And we said, look, we need to try to do import substitution for these specific categories. So we organized these contests for local uh, technology developers, engineers, uh, together between enterprise and academia to develop local solutions for government purchases. And, and we did a, a really good job. We uh, replaced 
over $300 million worth of imports in a matter of two years, which for a country like ours is a, a, a lot of money. And of course, that meant that we had local uh, technology, and most of which was actually applying open source technology elsewhere uh, to our uh, benefit. Now, one of the contradictions that uh, we faced in, in our knowledge uh, policy was how open, you know, the degree of openness. You know, how far do we go in terms of opening up, you know, open government and so on, but especially how far do we go up open in terms of our genetic and our biological resources? As you may imagine, Ecuador is, uh, is one of the most biodiverse countries in the planet. It's a very small territory, but it has a huge biodiversity, including in the Galapagos Islands and the Amazon rainforest and different uh, climates and ecological uh, environments. And uh, this biodiversity, if there is no specific legal framework, by default, is basically open. Now, who can take advantage or who has taken advantage of the openness of our biological and genetic resources, specifically, for example, that of the Amazon? And I don't have to say much, but the pharmaceutical company Pfizer published this book called El Sueño Mágico de Shaman the magic dream of shaman, which explains the development of medicine. And the story basically tells of uh, Pfizer scouts that go to the Amazon and ask the local uh, indigenous ancestors on tips as to what the medicinal plants are. And then they develop medicine and then they basically uh, leave. <laughs> and uh, indigenous uh, people uh, stay there in, in basically poverty, right? So this is uh, not something I came up with. This is actually a book by uh, the pharmaceutical company showing exactly what happens in our societies. One of the issues we have is why is this knowledge completely open? Why is there no protection? Why isn't, why isn't the discussion on patents and, uh, and uh, intellectual property around biodiversity and ancestral knowledge? Should the knowledge of ancestral peoples, indigenous peoples of the Amazon be open for anybody to take advantage of or should it be relatively closed or should there be a regulated openness where it benefits those communities and the state. Well, we came up with the first <laughs> international index for biopiracy. And we analyzed Ecuadorian biodiversity, especially medicinal plants and some vegetables, that only grow and are endemic to Ecuadorian ecological uh, floors. And um, we compared that to patents that were being filed around the world. And we saw that basically uh, pharmaceutical companies were patenting knowledge either directly or derived from Ecuadorian biodiversity and associated ancestral knowledge to that biodiversity, right? So it's one thing to put a scout in the middle of the Amazon and have to try, you know, every one out of 10,000 different plants out there to see what happens with 10 years worth of studies in laboratories. And it's another thing if that scout can interview the shaman of the community and ask, which are the valuable medicinal plants. That saves the research efforts decades. So how is that 
retributed to the community that did take millennia to find that out. <laughs> Most of the time through trial and error of actually living or dying. Well, the international system has a, uh, an, an agreement called the, the um, uh, Covenant for Biological Diversity and the Associated Protocol, uh, Nagoya Protocol, which is supposed to benefit the local communities with uh, you know, some money, some uh, royalties for the use of genetic and biological material from those communities or from that country. However, there's still a discussion around the world whether the, those royalties should only go to the direct uses of that biodiversity or whether they should, they should all also be paid when there are derivative uses of that biodiversity. So for example, if they put that to make basically a chemical component, sure, maybe they will have to pay. But if from that chemical component there are other solutions like cosmetics, other medicine, or uh, something else, then should that also pay royalties to the original source? And that's where the discussion is uh, around the world. So uh, it's, it's very uh, contradictory that the, the rich countries of the world, industrial, industrialized countries, uh, are very strict in terms of demanding, uh, you know, basically property rights around intellectual property and enforcing anti-piracy measures and so on. But when it has to do with biological diversity, they say, oh no, you should keep that open because it belongs to the world, right? So this is one of the things and the contradictions that we found. And uh, we, we call this uh, biopiracy and we associated with the uh, other Andean and Amazonian countries, including Peru, to try to come up with a solid position uh, around the world, especially in WIPO and Geneva, uh, to uh, defend the right of communities and of states to benefit from this. Because if, if we have this responsibility to reach Buen Vivir, if we have a challenge of trying to leave extractivism and not exploit oil or you know, uh, timber and so on, but then maybe we should make nature in its biodiversity, associating it with knowledge and science and technology, be the alternative. I mean, there are all these rich big pharmas around the world, the cosmetic industry makes a lot of money, but none of that is going to the local communities, and it continues to be a pressure for extractivism. As you can see, the countries uh, that have uh, incurred in biopiracy, in, at least in the case of Ecuador, the most are the US, Germany, the Netherlands, Australia, Korea, and others, okay? So uh, this is uh, uh, something that uh, should continue to be studied in the context of Okay, but open, but for whose benefit? What we decided to do was to create a new university. We said, if we want to really transform our society uh, away from extractivism, away from oil production and mining, eventually into having biodiversity be an actual means of survival and of making ends meet for our society, we need to put resources into that. So we created a new university called Ikiam, which means uh, uh, jungle in uh, Shuar, in an Amazonian language. And uh, it's created in the middle of the Amazon. The, uh, the university is uh, my favorite, my personal favorite. Uh, as you can see there, uh, the university is endowed with 93,000 hectares of biological reserve, right? So it has eight different ecological floors up from the Andes down to the Amazon for the scientists of Ikiam. And they have <laughs> basically the best library in the world. And they uh, have the duty 
of finding the potential of the rich biodiversity of the region to basically offer an alternative future for those communities who live there and also for our country. Now the, the university is a bit larger now, there have been new buildings constructed, but the idea remains the same. Uh, 93 hectares of live laboratory and the Ikem University is now uh, the second university with most publications now, even by undergrad students uh, that have gone uh, into the taxonomy and investigating the uh, uh, potentials of the rich biodiversity uh, that we have. Now, as you can imagine, doing this is pretty hard. It's not easy because we have to uh, struggle with an international context that basically avoids countries from developing these pathways. It's not uh, as if it's only political will that we have to deal with. We have to deal with the WTO restrictions, especially the trade-related international property uh, rights, the patent convention treaty, and some decisions of Andean nature. But we have done a lot to try to overcome this international framework. I personally read, uh, led the ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty, which allows exceptions, for example, so that uh, access of, of authors, uh, of, uh, sorry, of uh, uh, intellectual property rights can be, uh, there can be exceptions to them when we want access for people with uh, visual impairment or disabilities. Uh, also other flexibilities that I will not get into the detail here, but uh, there's been a huge effort to try to regain some sovereignty in knowledge policy. As you may be aware right now internationally, there's a discussion of what's called the TRIPS waiver, uh, because around the world there's been a, what's called a vaccine apartheid. Right? The technology to produce the COVID vaccine is not democratized. Even in the context of a pandemic that has represented an earthquake in terms of our species, has there been enough willingness to share the knowledge of vaccine production? But what few people know is that there was also a respirator apartheid orphan drug apartheid, testing kits apartheid, chemical apartheid, and the huge technological dependence of big pharmaceuticals that have benefited in the context of the pandemic. Because the knowledge is not open. Because there is strict compliance with the international inter intellectual property framework, even in the context of a pandemic. What we did was use knowledge policy, progressive knowledge policy, to try to overturn this. And we uh, allowed ourselves to save over a billion dollars in purchasing medicine just with progressive knowledge policy that I will explain in a second. This allowed us to save uh, tons of money. How? Basically putting standardized generic requirements on our uh, medicine purchase policy uh, in Ecuador. And this has to continue forward, hopefully, uh, to allow us to increase access to medicine. So we have actual written, uh, sorry, actual uh, real life experience by um, democratizing knowledge and having that represent huge reductions in budget and more access for medicine just with knowledge policy, with adequate knowledge policy that avoids uh, harsh intellectual policy uh, restrictions. Now, there are many other things that we wanted to do that we didn't have the time to do that I will only mention here, but uh, th this is an ongoing struggle for developing countries. What we can do in terms of knowledge policy to actually have a little bit more of a say uh, in terms of our destiny, in terms of our, our future. I'm going to conclude with uh, what has been my story in, in the last uh, year or so. 
And, so, and it's that uh, I didn't expect it, but uh, in 2020, around the middle of the year, in the middle of the pandemic, I got a call from our political uh, leader who led what we call the Citizens Revolution, Rafael Correa, and he said, hey, you know, I really like the policies that you've been pushing during the government and so on, and uh, I want you to be the candidate that represents the progressive forces in the future election. And of course I said yes. <laughs> so I had to campaign around the, the, the country for almost a year. Uh, I did win the first round of the vote. Unfortunately, in the second round, uh, I, uh, I lost by a, a small margin. Uh, I got 48% uh, of the vote against uh, 52. Um, but what we would have applied, uh, the type of policy that we would have applied had we won, is exactly what I'm talking to you about today. That of a sovereign, technological, buen vivir-oriented policy that would have worked with the knowledge community, not only in our country, but around the world, to try to change our reality, to try to approach to our paradigm of buen vivir. And as a small demonstration of that, I want to finish with a video that uh, was part of our political campaign, what we called Democracy 3.0, which was basically citizens' participation in our common destiny. We developed what was called the Wiki Plan. Con la Democracia 3.0, construye tú también el plan de gobierno para recuperar el futuro. Sé parte del Wikiplan. Ingresa a www.andresarauz.es slash plan de gobierno. A través del Wikiplan podrás realizar tu aporte para el gobierno de todas y todos. Es de libre acceso, de participación horizontal y democrática. ¿Cómo puedes participar? Es muy sencillo. Regístrate. Crea tu cuenta. Ingresa tus datos y confirma tu correo. Accede y edita tus propuestas. Participa de las discusiones en los distintos temas de debate. La democracia 3.0 nos permite estar conectadas y conectados. A recuperar el futuro. Sé parte del Wikiplan. This is the Ecuador that would have been. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, thank you very much for this inspiring presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, how do you balance uh, the technological needs of society um, when, uh, with, with obviously uh, national sovereignty, digital sovereignty, energy sovereignty, educational sovereignty, when uh, a lot of these uh, technological advances and developments are being made by big multinationals, can the nation state actually have its own means of production of that technology that will help to advance, or do you need to compromise somewhere? Yeah, I mean, it is a challenge, you know, when, uh, when I was there, for example, we had, uh, uh, you know, one of the largest big techs in the world, Google, basically give out uh, their entire software to, uh, their educational software to the Ministry of Education. And the minister comes to me and says, why am I not taking this if it's free, right? If it's, it's completely free, how, how can you be so crazy? to say, don't accept this. And, uh, and of course, because uh, ministers and the people in, in the public sector say, I, I need to save a few dollars from the budget, maybe that's uh, uh, the right uh, choice. So it's very difficult to try to make them understand that there is an issue of dependence beyond just the, the budget issue. And this can be replicated in many other areas of, of uh, government policy. Uh, so, uh, once you have an, 
I mean, once you put a value into independence and especially into generating an epistemic community within the country or in partnership among countries in the region, which was what we thought that we had to do because we were too small to do it all ourselves, and especially with other technologies, uh, open source technologies and communities that exist already around the world, uh, you could build an, an alternative to all that. So that's what we, en what we ended up doing. Uh, we ended up uh, uh, building our own alternatives and partnering with both companies, academia and communities in the region to try to find uh, uh, our, our own options. You know, uh, sometimes they are not the most uh, avant-garde technologies, but they are the appropriate technologies for both our level of development and our intent at keeping and maintaining technological sovereignty. Sorry to say though, this only lasted for a few more months after we left when the new government uh, arrived that uh, were much more conservative in nature and neoliberal in orientation uh, ended up basically giving everything away to, to big tech. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just have a question and it's about how the government of, the, of Ecuador is aligning the policy or openness policy ecosystem that they already have because they have the gobierno abierto, so of course they have an open government um, approach, but also they have a policy for open education for the primary sector, for primary and, and high school level. Where is the alignment or where it's kind of the strand for, for Ecuador looking towards the future in, in the context of opening up to knowledge and education and governance? Well, I think there are many challenges there, you know. Uh, the, like I said, the, the, perhaps the most important change has to be at the cultural level, at the day-to-day -day habits and practices of, of the use of technology, and also of the citizens demanding uh, that uh, these, these practices can be kept during, uh, for, for a longer time. For example, in terms of open government, if you don't have an active citizenry, an active civil society, that demands that the government keep on publishing the, the, the material or making everything available as before, uh, then they will stop doing it, right? Because of, what, for whatever reason, and it intends to uh, basically get, get lost, you know? For example, something so simple as an archive of the institutional web pages and government documents that were official documents, you know, only five years ago, you can't even find them on the web anymore. Fortunately, we have the Internet Archive and, and so on, and, and some of that stuff is, is there. But there is, the, the official repositories uh, are, are not uh, keeping that information, and, and countries like ours are extremely vulnerable to, uh, uh, yeah, you could even say, intents of, for censorship or uh, for hiding social memory from the public by basically taking things down from, from the web. Hola, <laughs> un gusto conocerte personalmente, realmente eh, muy admirable todo lo que se ha realizado en Ecuador en, durante el gobierno. Uh, I'm going to switch to English. <laughs> um, I was thinking uh, about how this model of the democratization of knowledge uh, has been able to be consolidated you told that not, it's not, but uh, how uh, can be itself a state as a policy beyond the government, one government, and be as a, um, a state policy? Hmm? And it, if it is possible to look far beyond uh, the political ups and downs of our Latin American region, what do you think about that? The, the main weakness that we found in our uh, political project was that we put our best minds and our best leaders uh, from years and decades of social and militant work into the state. And we left civil society, you can call it sort of empty, right? The, 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 the leaders from civil society 
went to work in the government, and then when we lost the government, we didn't have civil society anymore. So, even though on, in, the, in the theoretical construction of our political project, we knew that uh, popular power, right? So the power of the people and citizens' participation was absolutely key. In the practice, that was lost over the years. So mo many of the leaders that I mentioned from civil society who participated in the construction of the new constitution, with time, went to work for the government, and then there was nobody to keep the pressure on either this government or the next government or the next to keep the policies in, in place. So uh, uh, I'm convinced that any future intent, both in Ecuador and elsewhere in Latin America, implies having a strong social movement to uh, keep the demands in place and not to basically conform when uh, a center left or a progressive government arrives to, to power. So, and, and a, and a, and a leftist or center-left government has to be conscious of that as well and to try to keep pouring ideas, resources, and, and developing new leadership uh, in, in social movements and civil society. So I think that is the real uh, sort of strong answer to, to that. Oh, hi. So thank you so much for your talk. It's more than education for democracy. I would say emancipatory education. So I am from Brazil, but I work at the Open University, but very close to the University of Amazon in Brazil. So I would like to know if uh, your ideas open policy, if you are working together with other countries, including Brazil, Yes, just uh, because I think that it, working on this idea of uh, social innovation together with the people who are there might be stronger. Yeah, thank you. For, in, the, in the case of the regional uh, Amazon University, ICAM, we, we did have collaboration with uh, a university uh, in Manaus, in Brazil, um, especially trying to partner around uh, the, the biodiversity and biopiracy issues. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, there is uh, not enough uh, both social and government-led coordination efforts in terms of knowledge policy. Uh, I think that in Latin America it's still viewed as too far away from the immediate priorities of giving food to everybody or you know, economic policy or trying to survive. Um, but if, if there's not a, a group of people at least trying to work on this, uh, it would be too hard. One of my uh, campaign proposals uh, last year was to work in the context of uh, Latin American uh, regional framework to have a Latin American Erasmus, right? So that we could have, you know, 100,000 Latin Americans do exchanges among universities in the region uh, so that uh, you, you could build a strong social base for uh, these transformations that, that we need and for uh, you know, fraternity purposes as well. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot that can be done with very little, but I, I just, I seem that when I talk about these things, it seems like I'm talking about too far from the immediate priorities of other politicians, you know what I mean? So hopefully that, that, can, uh, that can change with time once we realize that we are in the 21st century. <laughs> Hi, Nicole Saad here from the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I feel like this is the first time in a long time that I've been inspired by a politician. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so my question for you is, so I come from the Wikimedia movement and our mission, uh, our, one of the pillars of our mission is around knowledge equity. And so when you were showing um, about the university and the Amazon where they're doing all of this research, I could think that Wikimedians would immediately want them to like start creating Wikipedia articles about you know, the things that are being published. And so 
um, thinking about you know protection of indigenous knowledge and and um, all of the things you were sharing about like biopiracy and and that like what are the ethical guidelines that you would suggest for Wikimedians and OER developers as we think about knowledge equity and ensuring representation and closing knowledge gaps while also safeguarding indigenous knowledge um, and indigenous communities. Yeah, I mean I I. Uh perhaps won't get into to all the details of um, ethical behavior in terms of um, uh, OER uh, for indigenous knowledge, but I guess the main principle is to work together with the indigenous communities, right? So it takes a plane to go there and to try to say, how much of this do you want to, to open up and how much could be used even for promotional purposes, but that when you know the real deal comes, um, then, then uh, it can uh, it can actually represent an alternative, economic alternative for for indigenous communities, uh, in terms of their the ancestral wisdom. Um, I think uh, uh, that that is the real uh, challenge is to work together, and that's the idea of of the regional Amazon University because it's placed there. Uh, we had a, a challenge in the first year of that university because uh, only about four students the first year were from the actual Amazon. <laughs> All the others were from other parts of Ecuador that went to the Amazon. So you could think of that as internal colonialism. And, uh, and we said, why? <laughs> we need to change this. So we had to uh, come up with explicit affirmative action policies uh, so that students from the Amazon would want to study there, and not only from the Amazon, but actually from the communities themselves who want to go there, and we'd, we eventually changed that. So I think uh, uh, that's the kind of thing that has to be done, you know, uh, to, to try to uh, have uh, the local communities govern themselves uh, and, and whatever we can do to support them with, you know, uh, knowledge and, and so on to, to get there, yeah. But there are, I think, uh, a lot of discussions around this, and you can probably find uh, ethical standards uh, uh, at the UN level for this as well. Okay, so please join me in uh, thanking Andres for our fantastic talk. Thanks so much, Andres. Thank you, Andres.